What a great thing to be worshiping God again tonight. And I know God is pleased with us in our public worship whenever we do it. And again tonight, we want to draw nearer to God so that we feel his presence and his power through the week. And as I mentioned this morning, our theme is going to be prayer, whether it can extend a person's life. And that's kind of a, a neat thing to look at. And I hope that for all of our boys and girls, teens, and all of us tonight, God's word will be something that's helpful to you when you reflect on who you are as God's child. And with that in mind, I'd like to read from Job 19. This is verse 25, 26, and 27. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved on the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, with my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me and melts. How wonderful that is. Let's ask God to be with us as we look at the privilege of living with him. Father in heaven, we come to you tonight to consider how great you are. Not only that you sent Jesus Christ to die for us on the cross, but that you raised him to new life and that now we are privileged to be living that new life. Help us to be alive, not just physically, but spiritually. And help us, Father in heaven, not only to expect an abundant life here on earth, but eternal life to come because we know that life in the Lord Jesus Christ is wonderful and powerful. And now, Father in heaven, as we have our time of silent prayer, may each of us be led to reflect on what living for Jesus really means. Hear our prayers, O Lord, and answer them for Jesus' sake. Amen. We're going to sing one of the most popular songs in Christendom, and that is, What a Friend We Have in Jesus. We're going to sing the old traditional tune, not the new ones. This morning I kind of goofed you up a couple of those songs. For six months I haven't been using the Gray Salter hymnal, so I just forgot to look at the tunes, and I would have said, Let's sing it for the tunes that we grew up with and that our kids are probably going to sing for the centuries, not the ones that they inserted for us in the gray Psalter hymnal. Shame to have a Psalter hymnal named after me and then have tunes I don't like. So, but that's the way it is in life, huh? Okay, let's rise and sing What a Friend We Have in Jesus.
The wonderful thing is, is that all of us have experienced God answering prayers and filling our hearts with peace and love. And tonight, Jesus is here with us. The Holy Spirit is in our hearts and God our Father is greeting us. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ through the power and fellowship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. We confess our faith together in the words of the Apostles' Creed. Around the world today, people have said together, I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And we sing, My Faith Looks Up to Thee. You may be seated. Boys and girls, I have a message to you from the council. And they say, we're not going to have a children's message until fall again. So for summer, we're taking a little break from that. But I'm going to tell you, boys and girls, the children's message that I was going to have anyway. And it's one that I actually did this morning when I talked to you about children just about the age well probably about the age of our pastor's children and the children i see out here too where their mother died of cancer and their father died of cancer and so grandma and grandpa had to bring them up and every single mom and dad here boys and girls wants to live to see you grow up to be a strong christian man or woman and if they get sick, 
they're going to really pray hard that God gives them long life so that they can live. Now, do you think that we can ask God to have longer life and that God is going to answer our prayer? Or do you think probably God decided how long we're going to live anyway, so what good does it do to pray? And so that's kind of the things that we're going to talk about tonight. But before we get to that, let's pray. And I know that your congregation always was a congregation that had requests. And I have a couple here that I was going to uh, mention in prayer. And uh, Alice Faber, as uh, her life is uh, seemingly, humanly speaking, uh, coming toward an end. And uh, we know that there's some in our congregation that uh, are struggling with cancer. And we want to remember them in our prayers as well. So uh, I don't know by name all of those, but that's what I heard this morning. So uh, any additional requests that you'd like to make tonight? Oh, you guys grew bashful in that time I was gone. One for you, from you, yes. Okay, yeah, I've got your grandma listed right there in the prayer tonight, but thank you for mentioning that. Yeah, your grandma's a wonderful lady. So, yeah, we know her pretty well. She makes good things, too, cookies and stuff, too, doesn't she? Great grandma, yeah. Any other requests tonight? Yes. Our daughter Kelsey graduated from that school this past weekend, and praise God for that. That baby's off the way out of Las Vegas. Okay. Does she know where she's going to practice? The Autonomous Science Center. Oh. Okay. Did she go to the University of Wisconsin for a degree? Iowa State. Iowa State. Doesn't she know that Culver started in Wisconsin and came to Iowa? So, <laughs> yeah, anyway, yeah, I hope that her practice and the people she practices with really embrace her in their practice, and I'm sure she'll do very well. So, any others? Yes. Okay, the Supreme Court. And that whole battle. I figured here in Inwood, we're too polite to one another to have protests. We know I've had barricades set up by our church or anything, but it is sad that the infringement of freedom of religion is being a eroded to the degree that they allow those kind of protests. Anything else? Anyone else? Okay, let's go to God here in evening prayer and ask for his blessing on us. Father in heaven, we come to you in prayer tonight in the confidence that you hear every single prayer that we pray. And when we pray as a church family together, you're hearing us too. We've said our individual prayers at home. We've said our family prayers together around the table. And now we come as a church family and we gather not around a table sitting in pews, but it doesn't matter because you hear us and you answer us in the way that's best for us. But we don't always think at the time that your answer is best for us. And so we come to you today to pray for the peace of Jesus Christ 
and the answers that you're giving us, Heavenly Father, requested through the work of the Holy Spirit with groanings we can't even utter, including this prayer tonight. We come to you first, thinking of the great controversy in our country over 50 years of just a few people deciding that our country could be one of eight in the world in which abortion was practiced without penalty of malpractice. And here we are, 50 years later, same issue, but prayerfully, hopefully, the opposite result. That as a nation, we will not permit the kind of abortion that's taken place. We've lost a whole generation and generations of children who could grow up to be happy and healthy, working on the farm, working at McDonald's. How sad. And yet, Father in heaven, you've now put us in the position where we have enough who believe in the value of human life to reverse that decision. But we know it won't be easy. It won't be without violence. It won't be without hurt. But help us as a country to do what is right. What your word demands that we do. And reward those faithful efforts of 50 years of marches on Washington, D.C., in the cold of January. Bless those who opened so many clinics to help women in time of need. Lord, hear our prayer for Jesus' sake. We think of Kelsey, too, who's graduated from vet school, and we know that as you created us, you created all the animals. And what a privilege it is to work with them. And in many ways, much more difficult than to be a doctor. At least we people can respond to the doctor. No matter what animal we work on, there's no ability to know what that animal feels or wants or needs. And so those who go into that profession, we're so thankful that they're caring for your creation in this way. So continue to bless her and her life and may she really feel that she's been called to care for this part of your creation, the animal world. We also come to you, Father in heaven, tonight because we realize that there are those in our church family who have some special needs. And we think of Helma Davilar tonight uh, we know that you've gifted her with many blessings that she shared with us through the years. And we're so happy that she's been a part of our church family. And as she battles with cancer, as do so many, that she will be the victor. And that with her physicians, the cure for a cancer will come about, at least for her cancer. We thank you for the many runners and walkers yesterday who participated in that cancer run, raising money so that cancer research can continue. We pray, Father in heaven, that you'll bless that as well. And we think of the generation on whose shoulders we stand, Alice Faber is one of them. And we think of the many who pioneered the, our congregation, 
saw to its founding, prayed for its vitality, and now here we stand on their shoulders. And with your blessing, we pray that our church family will really prosper. We thank you for our boys and girls who remind us that there's a real future to the church. And we thank you for our geographical location, not so far from Sioux Falls, that in the years to come, no doubt our community will start to grow rapidly and we'll be the welcoming church to bring new people into fellowship with Jesus. We thank you too, Father in heaven, that we can patiently wait for you to answer our prayers, to fill our lives with your love and peace. And as we look tonight at what it means for you to respond to our prayers, that we all will have a better understanding of Scripture. Help us, Lord, to really hear what you have to say to us in your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We're turning tonight uh, to 1 Kings chapter 20. And now you boys and girls who are in grade school, you probably have learned all the kings of Israel. And you know Ahab was the worst king, bad King Ahab. But there was good King Hezekiah. Remember him? We're going to read about him here in chapter 20 of 2 Kings. And out of reverence for the word of God, we're going to rise and we hear 2 Kings 20. And the title the translators give it is Hezekiah's Illness. Now listen, boys and girls. In those days, Hezekiah became ill and was at the point of death. The prophet Isaiah, son of Antimator, went to him and said, This is what the Lord says. Put your house in order because you are going to die. You will not recover. I need a little more light to read. I see the eye doctor for three hours tomorrow to find out what my eyes can do better. So, uh, pardon me for that. So, anyway, he was a son of Amator. Hezekiah turned his face to the wall and prayed to the Lord. Remember, O Lord, how I have walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. And Hezekiah wept bitterly. Before Isaiah had left the middle court, the word of the Lord came to him. Go back and tell Hezekiah, the leader of my people, this is what the Lord, the God of your father, David, says. I have heard your prayer and seen your tears will heal you. And on the third day from now, you will go up to the temple of the Lord. I will add 15 years to your life and I will deliver you and this city from the hand of the king of Assyria. I will defend this city for my sake and for the sake of my servant David. Then Isaiah said, prepare a poultice of figs. And they did so and applied it to the boil and he recovered. Hezekiah had asked Isaiah, what will be the sign that the Lord will hear me and that I will go up to the temple of the Lord on the third day from now? And Isaiah answered, This is the Lord's sign to you that the Lord will do what he has promised. Shall the shadow go forward ten steps or shall it go back ten steps? It is a simple matter for the shadow to go forward ten steps, said Hezekiah. Rather, have it go back ten steps. And the prophet Isaiah called upon the Lord, and the Lord made the shadow go back ten steps as it had done on the stairway of Ahaz. At that time, Merodach Beladan, son of 
Baldan, king of Babylon, went to Hezekiah, letters and a gift, because he had heard of Hezekiah's illness. Hezekiah received the messengers and showed them all that was in his storehouses, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fine oil. His amory and everything around found among his treasures. There was nothing in his palace and in all his kingdom that Hezekiah did not show them. Then Isaiah the prophet went to King Hezekiah and asked, what did those men say and where did they come from? From a distant land, Hezekiah replied, they came from Babylon. The prophet asked, what did they see in your palace? They saw everything in my palace, Hezekiah said. There is nothing among my treasures that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of the Lord. The time will surely come when everything in your palace and all that your fathers have stored up until this day will carry off to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. And some of your descendants, your own flesh and blood that will be born to you, will be taken away, and they will become eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. The word of the Lord you have spoken is good, Hezekiah replied. For he thought, will there be not peace and security in my lifetime? As for the other events of Hezekiah's reign, all his achievements and how he made the pool and the tunnel by which he brought water into the city, are they not written in the book of the annals of the kings of Judah? Hezekiah rested with his fathers, and Manasseh, his son, succeeded him as king. You may be seated. We also read in the New Testament uh, one verse that comes out of uh, Philippians chapter 1, it's verse 21, and it's very simple and short, and I know you've heard it many times over. Paul says, For me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Friends in Jesus Christ, we are all born to live. That's the way God created us in the first chapter of the Bible and the second and third. And we read about all of those wonderful events. And so we learn in the first two chapters how we are to live. And we learn in the third chapter why it is that we die because of our sin. But the truth is, that you and I were created to live. And inside of us, there's that feeling, I do not want to die. And so we'll spend lots of money to live a little bit longer. And the medical community is built on that internal feeling that we have, is that I must live as long as I can. Sometimes forgetting that we all are going to live forever. Because after this life is over, we have a wonderful life with the Lord Jesus Christ in heaven, and with the Holy Spirit who has moved in our lives, and with God our Father, who is such a merciful person to us while we've been here on earth. So really, we don't have to worry one bit about living because we will either have a great life here on earth, God guided, or we will have eternal life in heaven, which is perfect. And that's natural. That's born into us. And even people who are not Christian know that too. Because what do people say? Oh, yeah, I know I'm going to hell. All my friends are there anyway. Yeah, they know there's a heaven and a hell, even if they themselves don't plan to go to the heaven and should prefer to be with their friends in hell. One of the richest men I ever had in a congregation 
perhaps the richest, in his 80s, was diagnosed with cancer. And he was in Chicago on the 13th floor of Rush Presbyterian St. Luke's, the premier hospital in Chicago for cancer. And so I went to see him. And I entered his room and I said, and you're here because of what? And he said, well, cancer. And I said, well, what are you going to do? Nothing. Why would I spend good money to stay out of heaven? Now, when you're in your 80s, that's easy to say. But if you're sitting here tonight with children on your lap, or maybe a little older than that, it wouldn't be so easy to say, would it? I think all people in their 80s who are really thinking about it say, what does the Bible say? I can live to be 70 years old or by reason of strength, 80. So now I'm 84, 85, 86. Yeah, why would I spend good money to stay out of heaven? Especially if we know how difficult some cancer treatments can be, how uncomfortable. So we can sort of think about those things. And as we do think about those things, our head and our heart go in different directions. Our head tells us, yes, I'm going to eternal life. And so if I can extend my life here on earth by spending thousands of dollars for a couple months and I'm miserable the whole time, yeah, why should I do that? But our heart says, I want to see my kids. I don't want to leave my spouse. My heart says, I've lived here and I've enjoyed living in such a wonderful agricultural re uh, region of the country. I don't want to lose that. And so I'll spend any amount of money to stay alive for my spouse, alive for my kids, alive just to enjoy your creation, God. And so there we are torn between head and heart. Well, the Bible gives us a good example about dying, and it's good King Hezekiah. Hezekiah was a wonderful king. We know how well he ruled. We know that God blessed him above many of the other people in this world. And so comes the question. Can I extend my life by prayer? Sure you can. Hezekiah did it. God hasn't changed, has he? So, why wouldn't God do it? Now, for a while, as this message has gone on, you're seeing up there supralapsarian view, intralapsarian view. You're wondering what that is. Well, I got to have my teenagers who maybe just come out, are in catechism or coming out of catechism recently. You probably have talked about these big words. Actually, even though it looks like a long word, it's not very long. Because when you look right in the middle of the word, it says lapser. Well, that's the Latin word, uh, which for us means rock or solid. So, Supra means before the solid decision was made. Infra is after the solid decision was made. Now, what is that solid decision? 
That solid decision is what one God, the one God makes when we are conceived. And so when you were conceived in your mother's womb, and we remember that on Mother's Day, God knew how many hairs you'd have on your head. Every day when you ran your comb through your hair and there was a hair that came out, God knew it. And so he knew how many days you were going to live. And he knew how you were going to plan those days and how you were going to use them. Whether you were going to believe on Jesus or not. Whether you were going to go to heaven or hell. He knew it all. Now the superlapsarian says he knew that before the foundation of the world. And why don't we just look at that text tonight. I think it'll be the next slide. Yes, here it is. He chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us and the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us with all wisdom and understanding. And he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ, to be put into effect when times will have reached their fulfillment, to bring all things in heaven and on earth together under one head, even Christ. That's Ephesians 1, 4 to 10. So the superlapsarians say before the world was created, God made these decisions about you sitting in the pew in Inwood Christian Reformed Church tonight. And he knew that when you combed your hair before you came today, what hairs were going to fall out? The inverlapsarian says, oh, that makes God the author of sin. Then back in the, in the Garden of Eden, God just let Adam and Eve sin, and yeah, he could have stopped it, but he didn't. So he says, after the fall, God came up with this plan. And the Inverlapsarian thinks like some of the poems that we have that talk about how Jesus came forward and told the Father, yeah, I'm willing to go down and sacrifice myself so that we can have all these children who believe in me and so forth. Yeah, those are all kind of infralapsarian poetic ways of talking about this. So going back about 70 years, that would be your great, great grandparents. They used to argue about those two things. And this is what happened on Sunday night after church. They would invite each other over to their homes. And you boys and girls would get to play games. And if it was summer, you'd play tag. Or winter, you'd go sledding. And mothers would sit together in the kitchen. And they would talk about their families. And the men, they would go into the living room. And they would take out their cigars. They liked the Van Dams, and they liked the crooks that were soaked in liquor. That's what they tell me was the two favorite cigars. And there they would smoke. And they would argue vigorously about superlapsarianism and infralapsarianism. And they would get so excited and so involved that their voices would rise and it was almost like they were angry with each other. And you'd think, well, they didn't get anywhere tonight. So what would they do? Next week, Sunday night, get together in somebody else's house and do the same thing over again. They love to argue these theological points. 
Now, the reason that I'm taking you back in that journey is because it illustrates for us how we struggle with what is my responsibility and what is God's responsibility. And you see, after the infra-supra debates, they went into percentage debates. And the percentage debates was some said, well, God controls everything, so he's maybe got 99% of the control. And me, I'm just a one percenter. Other people said it was 80-20, some 50-50. Until a theologian came along by the name of Herman Bobbing, Herman Bobbing and he said, 100% of our life is providentially planned. 100% of our life is human responsibility. Terrible mathematics, but biblical theology. And when you stop to think about it, isn't that really the way it is? In this scripture lesson that we read, here in 2 Kings 20, God spoke first. God's responsibility was spoken through Isaiah the prophet. And he said, Hezekiah, you're going to die. What did Hezekiah do? He turned on his bed and he faced the wall and he cried out to God in prayer. And he cried bitterly. Remember, O oh Lord, how I've walked before you faithfully and with wholehearted devotion and have done what is good in your eyes. He didn't want to die. That was his responsibility. 100% God's, 100% Hezekiah's. So then what did God do? Now, the, you know, if we're thinking like a tennis game, Ball goes back and forth. Now it's God's responsibility turn. What does God do? He says, oh, I heard that prayer. So he sends Isaiah back and he says, you're going to live 15 more years. Wow, now that was good news. So now King Hezekiah knew that God had heard his prayer, answered his prayer just as he wanted, and he was going to have 15 more years. But then we come to the second half of the chapter. And then it's not so much about the prayers of Hezekiah, but instead the translators give us this little title in here about what he did with his life. What he did with those last 15 years that God gave him. He had illness. He recovered, but then foolishly he showed the, the men from Babylon all of his riches. All of what had been developed in that kingly line for years. And all of it would be used. These men were like spies and they prepared for Babylon to come and take over. And so if you're praying for additional life so that you can see your grandchildren or you can see your children graduate or so you can see this or that happen in your family tree. You may pray for it. And God may do exactly what he did for Hezekiah. And for all those wrestling with cancer or other debilitating diseases, we hope that God answers prayer just as he did Hezekiah's prayer. Oh, I know we can talk about medicine and the medical profession and all of that. But we know deep down, don't we, that doctors can treat us, but God heals us. And so we're at that 100% of God's providence and 100% of our responsibility still on the seesaw of life 
working together so that those things come to pass just as it ought to be. So should we ask God to give us additional life or should we not? One thing we know for certain is that prayer changes things. On Monday nights, during the year, boys and girls, when you have children's worship, I lead a group of men in men's life in the First Christian Reformed Church of Sioux Falls. And among those men are some doctors young doctors in their 30s, 40s. And we were talking about some of these kind of theological issues because we were in Genesis and we're going through Genesis really slowly, verse by verse. And these uh, doctors, one of the doctors said, you know, when I went to med school, the professor said, you know, we, we observe this, that people who have a prayer group support behind them, family, church, they respond better to surgery. They overcome more disease. They are medically more competent. We're pleased when we see that. They said it doesn't really matter what church they're in or what denomination they're a part of. If they have a group behind them really praying, they really respond much better to our medical care. So I said to the doctor, did you go to Loma Linda? Now that's the huge Seventh Ann Hospital in Southern California where they prepare men for medical missions. It's a medical mission hospital. And for those of you who are familiar with the Seventh Day Adventist missions, uh, you know that it's very extensive throughout the world. That's their way of doing missions through their medical care. No, he said, I went to the University of Iowa. And I said, oh, that's a pretty secular place. He said, that's right. Not one of my professors claimed to be a Christian. Not one of them said, because I'm observing this in my medical practice or in the medical practices that I see, do I become a Christian? But the reality is that prayer changes people and things. And it changes the way in which medicine works and the way our prescription of medication and our medical care works. It makes a difference. Now that's coming from people who are teaching doctors and they themselves admit that they're not Christians. So now you can sort of see that 100% responsibility that we have in conjunction with God's 100% responsibility to see that his plan for our life is persuasive and goes on. And so what we really have to see is that for us, we have to first of all recognize the power of prayer for one another, for the prayers that we offer tonight, for our grandma, for one of our saints in a rest home. Remember that our prayers are making a difference. And even our boys and girls, when they pray, it makes a difference. And yet, on the other hand, we know that God has to get, it to get us to heaven somehow. And so he allows illness and disease so that we can move from this life, which is grand and good and great and gracious, into the eternal life. 
And I think that's why Paul wrote in Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. Now, we're going to look at six ways for us to live is Christ. First, read your Bible every day. And I know a lot of you do that. And I know a lot of you are dead tired when it comes at night, late at night, and you still take time to read your Bible. Or you get up a half hour early in the morning before you really have to and read your Bible. Other of us read it during the day. Another of us follow a devotional book. It doesn't matter what we do. We need to stay in the Word of God. Second, we need to pray. And our prayers will make a difference. Third, we need to worship. And the more often we worship, the more often God is blessing us. Our brethren in the Southern Baptist churches worship Sunday morning, Sunday night, Wednesday night. And very often their churches are filled all three occasions because they know the value of worship. Now we've simply focused on two services. And you're here tonight in the second one. You need to be involved in Bible study that's beyond your personal devotions where you have a group sharing. And that's why it's great that you boys and girls are in Christian school and you have Bible in school. And it's great when you're in Sunday school class and you're learning there. And it's just great when we get together as adults and we study the Bible together. And fifth, we need to share. If you just have everything inside, you're not going to make progress in growing and it's a Christian. You need to share and share and share some more. And as Christian Reformed people, that's where we have the biggest challenge to grow. Because we're not sharers. We love to grow. We love to gather in. We love to be in our circle. But it's hard for us to get beyond that and really share. And finally, we need to simply pause. And think about where we are in our life. And if we ask God for more life, what will I do with that life? We have to pause at the end of each day and say, God, I saw you do this for me today, or I saw you do that for me today. And we need to pause sometimes in our life and just thank God how great you are. What you've done for me is fabulous. You know, we sometimes joke about the best farmer is the one who loses his crop seven times during the summer and takes in a tremendous harvest in the fall. But yeah, we do. We sometimes have to scratch our heads and think, God, why did you send us this kind of weather? But at the end, when we gather in the harvest, we say, God, you're gracious, you're good, you're wonderful. And we just need to pause and give God the adoration and praise for who he is. And that's why Paul wrote, to die is gain. I know there's tremendous fear of dying. There's tremendous pain when we part 
from our loved ones here on earth. We know that we will be missed when we're here no longer, but are in our heavenly home. But when we plead with God, God, I want to live longer. I want to see my kids grow. I want to see who my kids marry. I want to see grandchildren. But God says, you're going to die. You will fear. You will have pain. You will be sorely missed. But you will fall into the arms of Jesus who will give you an everlasting, wonderful, perfect life in heaven. And dying into Jesus' arms is better than artificially prolonging our life here on earth. And I hope you pause to think about this tonight. What's my responsibility 100%? God's already taken care of his 100%. Let's turn to him in prayer. Father in heaven, we need you desperately to help us sort through life and come to the place where we can deep, correctly and deeply understand how your plan for our life done before the worlds were created or for some Christians after sin came into the world we will know Father in heaven that you are perfectly carrying out your responsibility and send your Holy Spirit into our hearts so that we responsibly carry out our responsibility as well. We need you, Father in heaven, to guide us and direct us in this life so that we can be prepared to be received into the arms of Jesus when life is over. Lord, we don't know what our time will be but we do know what the final end will be forever in glory with you. Hear us as we sing, Lord, my petition heed. Amen. And let's rise to sing together, Lord, my petition heed.
Boys and girls, we began this morning with God greeting us as being our friend. And you just sang, he is our friend and he is your friend. He loves you and he cares for you. And we know that that's true whether our teen years, our older years, and even to the oldest member who's worshiping with us tonight, God is our friend. But we have a special happy time for you boys and girls when you go to Bible school. And I hope each one of you can go and we're gonna pray that you have a wonderful time at Bible school this year because that's what our offering is for tonight. Father in heaven, you're our friend. And we're gonna to go to Bible school with our friends. And they'll be there at Bible school, some boys and girls we don't know but help us to be friends to them so that all of us can just have a happy time together learning about Jesus and his great love to us. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for our boys and girls and for the privilege that they have of attending Bible school this summer. We pray in Jesus' name, amen. And God's blessing for the coming week is this. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen.